Hi, thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church and joining us online. Get ready for an awesome message. Good morning. I am not going to wrap my sermon today, okay? Not going to happen, all right? Hey, welcome to church today. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor. I want to thank everybody for coming today. I want to thank everybody that is watching us online right now. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in and staying connected to Passionate Life Church. All right, we are in a series called Refuge, and really what... The big idea about this series is, is that God is calling his church to be a refuge, a, a safe place, a place where uh, healing and, and training can happen simultaneously, that we're, we're called to be a refuge. And so we've been in this series uh, called Refuge, and uh, we, we went through hope, refuge of hope, because this is what I've been seeing. This is what I've been seeing. I've been seeing a lot of Christians walking around with no hope and no courage. And you want to talk about a giant oxymoron, okay? That is Christians, the, the hope of the world, walking around with no hope and courage. And it's because we, you, you know, the, the, the big question is, how is a Christian, how is a follower of Christ, am I supposed to act, talk, and think in a world that is anti-Christ, a world that, that is moving farther and farther away from the things of God, okay? And so last week, we specifically talked about uh, the demonic spirit of discouragement, right? We, we, we talked about that, and, and listen, if you missed any of the parts of this series, I want to encourage you, watch, go watch on YouTube, on our website. We've got a podcast. Listen to the podcast. Uh, and, and so you, we have different ways that you can listen and watch the, the message. And so uh, today, today, uh, real quick, I want to do, um, two, I want, I want to do two definitions just to, to get us in the right frame of mind. And then uh, we're, we're going to do part uh, four today uh, of Refuge, specifically on courage. Now listen, we're going to do courage next week. And we'll probably talk about courage the next week. I don't know. We might talk about courage until next year. I don't know. We're, we're just going like, to sit in this place where God wants us to sit. And I just feel like we're not supposed to rush, rush through this, this subject. And, and, and uh, what's, what's encouraging to me and what's refreshing to me is that every all week I, I, I prepare and I pray and I read my word. But when I get up here, uh, there's, uh, you know, I, I'm excited to hear what God is going to say through me, okay? Because I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit filter me today, okay? Come on, let's read some definitions. Refuge. Refuge is a shelter or protection from danger or distress, a place that provides shelter from weather, a, a safe place for training and healing that can happen simultaneously. This is what I believe that God is calling us to be as the church. Let's look at the definition of courage, and then we'll pray, and we'll get into God's word today. The definition of courage is the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain without fear. And what we've been talking about is that we can't even develop this thing called courage without difficulty, danger, and pain. And so maybe the situation that you're in today, God is trying to cultivate courage for your life. And so the subtitle of the title today is called A Different Kind of Courage. A different kind of courage. And this is where I believe that God is calling his church into. God is calling his people into a different kind of courage. Come on, let's pray, and then we'll get into God's word today. Father, we thank you for this moment. Holy Spirit, we thank you for every person that is tuning in right now online, that is in this place today, that it is not by mistake that they're here, God, that you have called them by name and, and you have a word for us today, God. You have a word for us today, Holy Spirit. And so I, I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd open our hearts, you would open our minds to the understanding of your word today. And Father, I just ask that I would just get completely out of the way, all of you and none of me, in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen and a 
men. And so where we're going to start today, now literally I had seven points this week, but it literally took way too long. And so I actually cut this uh, message in half and we're going to do a continuation next week. Okay. So this is part A, okay, um, to next week's part B. Okay. And so uh, where we're going to start today, where we're going to start today, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 50. Okay. Genesis chapter 50. And we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Joseph. If you don't know who Joseph is, or maybe you do know who he is, uh, let me just uh, remind you. Basically, Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. He was his favorite son. You want to talk about uh, some people in the Bible that had issues, okay? He had a favorite son, okay? And he made him a sweet jacket, all right? A uh, coat of many colors. And uh, his brothers were jealous of him to the point where uh, they wanted to kill him, but instead they sold him into slavery. And Joseph goes from being a slave, okay, going to prison multiple times, and, and he rises up all the way to second in command of all of Egypt, okay? And so what I, where I want to start today, I want to start with Joseph's last words, okay? He is on his deathbed, and these are Joseph's last words. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 50, 23 through 25. Joseph lived to see three generations of descendants of his son, Ephraim, and he lived to see the birth of the children of Manasseh, son of Maker, whom he call, claimed as his own. Soon I will die, Joseph told his brothers, but God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. And so th th these are Joseph's last words, okay? And he's saying, guys, don't forget that God has a promised land for you. Like God has a hope and future for your life. Like, like God hasn't called us to stay in Egypt, okay? He's got something better for us. So he's reminding them of this promise. He says, he will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear on an oath he said, when God comes to help you and lead you back, you must take my bones with you. Okay, what, what is he doing here? Does he believe that his bones are magic bones? Okay. No. Okay. What, what is Joseph doing here? Joseph is trying to get them to associate his bones with the promise of God. He's basically saying, guys, listen, if you don't remember the promise of God, at least Remember the last request, my last dying request, right, to bring my bones with you. He's, he's, trying to get, he's trying to get God's people to associate his bones with the promise. If you don't remember the promise, at least remember my, my dying request, okay, like, like you, that you're going to fulfill it, right? You're going you're gonna to have an oath to, to bring my bones with you. You. And so he's trying to get them to associate this incredible promise that he believes in, and he's trying to get his people to remember it, okay? Now, who was Joseph to the Israelites? I think this is really important to understand. Who was Joseph to the, the Israelites? Because I believe that it has a, I'm going to pull it in culturally, and what we're going through today as a church and, and, and Christians here in America with this story of how the Israelites saw Joseph. And so basically, Joseph was the man, okay, to the Israelites. Like, like he was the man, man. Like, like he was so revered, right? And this is what the people knew. This is what the Israelites knew. As long as Joseph was in power, they were going to be fine. They're going to be good. Like, we got Joseph, right? Like, Joseph is, is fighting for us. Joseph is going to make sure that we get food. Joseph's going to make sure that we are all right. In Joseph, we trust. <laughs> and so what happened, okay, what happened to God's people is they became lazy, complacent, and weak, because they were just like, man, we got Joseph. And, and what happened is they, they trusted more in a man than they did God. And nobody bothered, nobody bothered to develop any leadership skills because they're like, we got Joseph. It's all good. Joseph's going to make sure that we're all right. And so what do we see when Joseph dies? As soon as Joseph dies, a new king comes to power who does not know Joseph at all. And he's like, who are these Israelites? 
I hate them. He's like, let's enslave them. Let's just make them our slaves. There's no leadership at all within God's people to say, you know what? Slavery doesn't sound good. Anybody? Like... (laughs) And so what, what, what is happening, so what, what, what's been happening to our country and the church is that, and, and it's been happening for a while now, okay? It's been happening for a while now because we've, we've lived in this bubble of protection. And, and the reason why we've had bubble of protection is because of our forefathers who, who founded this nation to worship God freely, that slapped in God we trust on our money, that, that said, man, this is going to be a Christian nation. This is going to be a nation that is going to be under God, that's going to be blessed by God. And so this very, like, like, like literally our core uh, of who we are as a country, is, is been, it's, it's eroding away. And we see that more. And this has been happening for 30, 40 years. It's just been happening. We've just been blind to it because things haven't gotten bad. And then we had four years of Trump. And, and th- this is literally, this is what happened to the church and pastors. We're like, well, we've got Trump. He's got a voice enough for all of us. And we're good. Like Trump's going to fight for us. He's going to make sure that the the church is protected. He's going to make sure that we keep our freedom. He's going to make sure that we we keep our guns and we're able to talk freely. And so what happened intensely in these last four years is we got lazy, we got complacent, and we got weak. Because a lot of Christians and a lot of churches says, well, Trump's going to fight for us. We, we, we can't possibly, our government possibly wouldn't shut us down and call us not essential. Woo! That would never happen. And so what do, we, what do we see? Israel literally had no leadership. And guys, there, it, this happened when, when Billy Graham died. When Billy Graham died, there was a big hole in our country for, for a man of God to stand up. I mean, you want to talk about someone that everybody knew was connected to Jesus? Even atheists were like, yeah, that guy knows Jesus. You know what I mean? They're like, that guy knows God. Like, every president's like, okay, I need to have Billy come in, right? Because he's connected to God. And once he passed away, guys, there were, there's no voice. There, there, there's no voice of the church. There's no godly voice anymore that everybody respects. And there's a lack of leadership, spiritual leadership in our country because we have too many pastors and churches, and we'll talk about this more next week, that that care more uh, uh, about people liking them than actually preaching the gospel. And so, guys, we have a fragile church. And so when we, we go into a crisis, a crisis happens 30 to 40% of the church is now gone. And so here we see God's people, they lack leadership. Let's continue with the story here in Exodus. Exodus 1, 13 through 17. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Do you see what happens when there's no leadership? Guys, you see when when, when God's people don't know how to fight, you see what happens? Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives. Shephara... And Pua. Now, some of you, 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 if you're pregnant today and you're having a baby girl, maybe put these two names on the table. I don't know. <laughs> Pua's pretty good, okay? Pua's pretty good. When, when you help the Hebrew women as they gave, give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. Okay, so this, this godless 
king, Pharaoh, comes to power, and what does he do? He murders babies. Anybody see the comparison? I, mean, I talked about this last week. Nancy Pelosi just wants to push this bill through Congress that literally a woman can have an abortion all the way up to birth. Guys, there's no different. There's no difference between what they were doing in, in Bible times and what we're doing today. We're murdering babies. And so this is what happens when there's no spiritual leadership to stand for God. These types of things happen. And so I got four points today, four ways that can help us start developing a different kind of courage. Because God is looking for a church. He's looking for a people that have a different kind of courage. That, that, that can live and face opposition without fear. Because I think that definition of courage is like, okay, I get all of it except the last part, right? Without fear. Right? That, that's the hard part. How can I do things without fear? We do them by allowing the Holy Spirit to develop a different kind of courage in us that comes from God. A different kind of courage starts when we fear the Lord. When we fear the Lord. These, these midwives, why didn't they kill those babies? Because they feared God over Pharaoh. Exodus 1, 20 through 21. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And so we're, we're in this, this place culturally as a church that... We don't ever think about the fear of the Lord. Well, Pastor, I, I just like it when you talk about love and grace. Like, come on, can we just, just, just preach that every week? Okay, and, and this, is, this is what's happened, okay? Because guys like me, we grew, up, we grew up in the fire and brimstone era, okay? We, we heard preaching on hell every single week, and we were afraid to go to hell every single day, okay? Like, a little obsessive, right? Like, okay. And, and, but we swung the, over, the other way so much that, that you'll go years without hearing a message on hell. And it, it's because it's uncomfortable to talk uh, about judgment day that every single person, listen, every person on planet earth will stand before God Almighty with his blazing eyes of glory and we will be held accountable for everything that we've done in this body. Every second will be held accountable and that's uncomfortable. We don't, we don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it because I guarantee you, if you thought about that judgment day more often, there's a lot of things you wouldn't do. By just simply remembering, at some point, you're going to stand before God. And we're going to be judged. And, and, and what we do in this life matters. Guys, it It matters. If we want to develop this different kind of courage like these midwives had, they're just like, oh, we're just not going to kill. It's wrong. We're not going to kill babies. It's wrong. We know it's wrong. We fear God more than we fear. We've got to start having a healthy fear of God, knowing that he controls everything. No Nothing that is happening in our world today, God isn't just up in heaven being like, wow, blindsided. What am I going to do, Jesus? Like, he's in control. And what he is doing is he's trying to get the church back into a place where we have a different kind of courage, that we look different, we talk different than the rest of the world. And far too long, we look too much like the world. And so when people come into God's house, they're like, this is no different than happy hour. And that's a problem. 
And it's because we don't fear God. We don't fear that moment when we stand before God Almighty and He will judge us for everything we've done. It starts with fearing the Lord. Exodus 6, 8 through 9. This is God speaking to Moses. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Man, God is constantly like reiterating promises in our heart and our mind. He's, this is what he does, right? Moses reported, then Moses takes this report to, to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement, and we talked about that last week, discouragement is a demonic spirit that is trying to keep us quiet and make us quit in harsh labor. Point number two today, a different kind of courage starts when we overcome our past and present and accept the future that God has for us. You see, the Israelites were so stuck in the past, they were stuck in their present. They were so discouraged that they couldn't see a future beyond today. And maybe some of you are there today. Things are so bad in your life. Or maybe you just look at our world or you look at our country or you look at our city or you look at our state and you're just like, things are so bad. And, and you just keep thinking like, man, I wish we could go back to 1987 I don't know why 1987, but. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, you're just like, man, I just wish we could go back where things were better. And, and man, things weren't so complicated. And things weren't so, right? Like, and God's like, no, stop looking at your past and look towards the future that I have for you. Stop being so focused on, on, on your, your past problems and your current problems and the current issues of this world and start focusing on the future promises that God has in store for our lives. Guys, God can turn this thing all around. He can turn this thing around. Why? Because I know he's working. He is working. He never stops working. He's working right now. He's doing something. And I believe that he's stirring up his people. He's stirring up his church to have true courage, to have a different kind of courage before he pours out his presence. Let's continue. Exodus 3, 7 through 8. The Lord's talking to Moses again. He says, the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. Like God sees what's going on, guys. He sees what's going on in our life. He, he sees what we're going through. Like he's there. He's close to us. I have heard the cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, really like the ites, now live. <laughs> Point number three today, a different kind of courage starts when we get desperate for God. Are we desperate enough yet? No, I don't think we are. Those four words that move the heart of God. He heard their cries. Now, God's people were suffering, okay? They were in slavery. And they were crying out because of their current situation physically and, and monetarily. And I think most of us, we don't get desperate for God until things get bad in our personal life. Right? 
We, we won't turn to God and the things of God. We won't start praying or reading our Bible until something bad happens in our life. Now, that's, look, look, that's fine, okay? But we'll live 90% of the year not desperate for God until things get desperate in our own lives. And the call that I believe that God is calling his church to and his people to, this different kind of, of, of courage, I, he wants us to get desperate spiritually. Because some of you, your life is good. Your life is fine. And, and you, you can separate yourself from the issues and the problems of this world. But guess what that does? Nothing for this world. It doesn't affect your workplace. It doesn't affect your family. If you just disconnect from everybody, like we talked about that last week, you want to be the person, you want to be the family that moves by a river and lives in a van and eats squirrel on Tuesdays, right? Like, <laughs> he hears, he heard their cries. Church, are we at the point where we're crying out to God? Are we crying out to him to experience a, a real spiritual awakening, which Colorado has never experienced, a true revival in this land? Come on. Like, are, are we there yet where we're, we're desperate and we're saying, God, we need you to show up. God needs us to get desperate for the lost, broken, and hurting in our own lives first. Are we desperate for those co-workers that don't know Jesus? Are we, are we desperate from the, those family members that don't know Jesus? Are we, are we crying out to God? It was, it was God's people's cries that moved his heart. Are we desperate enough? Or, or do we have to wait so it gets so bad for everybody, right? Where we have people hoarding toilet paper again in their garage. Do you know what I mean? Do we need to get to that point again before we start crying out to God, before we get desperate for God? Listen, desperation has, has nothing to do with how much money you have in the bank. Desperation has to do with your soul and what you want God to do in your life, in your family's life, and in our city. Guys, it starts with us here. God wants us to cry out for the lost, the hurting that, that are here, that are in our city. Come on. Like, want to have a different kind of courage? God is asking us to cry out. He's asking us to get desperate for the people that are lost, hurting, and broken. Let's continue. Exodus 5, 1 through 2. So Moses and Aaron get this awesome word from the Lord, like, man, and the people get fired up, right? The people are getting fired up. They're like, okay, let's do this, right? Let's go. Let's leave Egypt. And so Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, and they say this. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so, retorted Pharaoh? And who is the Lord? And why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. I will not let Israel go. A different kind of courage starts when we are willing to confront the godless. I mean, you want to talk about courage? Like Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh? Like they, they could have been dead at any moment. Killed. I mean, we want to talk about a different kind of courage. Yeah, we'll approach Pharaoh and, and we'll ask him to leave it. You know, ask him to let us leave. This is a different kind of courage. Why? Because they were willing to confront the godless. Guys, far too long, we've just stayed silent and just let the world do whatever they want to do. And so we're at the point now where they literally give courage awards to previous Olympic athletes who want to dress like women now, or dress like a woman now, and put lipstick on, and we give him a, 
a courage ward? Come on. Come on. Someone should be like walking beside that brother and helping him through his mental illness. And yes. guy, like, what are we doing? Like, hello, like, where is the church? Where is the voice that says, guys, this is wrong. Somebody should be helping these people and telling them the truth. Instead, we get uncomfortable. Some of you are really uncomfortable right now. You know, I love it. Because this is what it takes to stir up some real courage that God is asking us. We've got to say, you know what? Abortion's wrong. And so we're going to rally up and we're going to vote against it. But we got to be willing to confront the godless because far too long we just stepped back. We've stepped back from our schools. We've stepped back from government. We, we've just stepped back. And some of us have, have, you know, we wake up to an America that we don't acknowledge. We, we don't even like, what, what planet do I live in? And it's because we have a culture of social media that celebrates and, and, and applauds sin. It, it applauds sin. And because the church is discouraged, because the followers of Christ are discouraged, we're just ready, we're, we're just okay with being quiet and, and, and just quitting. Just be like, fine, whatever. Guys, God hasn't called us to quit. Come on, we're, we're the light of the world. And this is what happens, guys. This is what happens when we confront the godless. God will fight for us. God will fight for us. We won't even have to do the fighting. And I think that's what's so overwhelming. Like, well, if I confront this at my work or if I confront this with my friend, then what will I say? I won't have... Guys, you won't have to. God will fight for you. What happens, guys, what happens after Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh? Oh, God takes care of it. Oh, yeah, he does. They didn't have to fight. God just sent a bunch of plaques. And they were just like, told you. <laughs> Should have let us go. But we're so used to fighting with our own strength. We're so used to relying on our own resources to figure things out. And I believe that God is trying to get his people in a vulnerable place that say, you know what? I can't fight this battle. We need, we need a move of God. We need revival. We need a spiritual awakening in, in our city, in our state, in our country. If things are going to get turned around, God needs some people that fear him more than anything else. I mean, Jesus even says that. He goes, guys, listen, you should be more concerned about the one that can destroy your soul than what humans can do to you. You need to be concerned about the God Almighty. And guys, man, God wants to fight for his people. He wants to show out for his people. He wants to show, he wants to be put on display to this world. God's calling us into this different kind of courage. But it starts with these four things, guys. We've got to start fearing the God. We gotta be willing. We gotta be willing to, to confront the godless. And guys, we can do that in kindness, okay? It's God's kindness that leads people to repentance, okay? We, we can still do it within love. And I'm gonna talk about next week. See, this is, this is the problem cutting my sermon in half because I still got so much to say. Because we look at the leadership of Jesus. I'm going to do it anyway, okay? <laughs> because if, if listen, we'll, we'll end here. We'll end here, okay? And then we're going to take communion. We look at the leadership of Jesus, okay? And, and if we were to put Jesus in our current culture, 
Jesus would be labeled as a mean leader. He would be mean. The way he would talk to his disciples, the way he talked to Peter, he called him Satan. <laughs> How would that go over if you told your boss, get behind me, Satan? Like, <laughs> to, like Jesus would be mean. Like, you know what I mean? And that's not Jesus. Jesus isn't the problem, okay? We're the problem. Yes. God's calling us to a different kind of courage. And man, God wants to fight for us. Man, you saw when, when, when the midwives stood up and confronted the godless, when they chose to fear God and not man, what happened? God blessed them. God blessed them. He put his favor on them. Like that's what God has in store for us. But we've got to step into the courage that he's called us into. Come on, let's bow our heads this morning and close our eyes. First things first. Maybe you'd say today, Pastor, I've never said yes to Jesus, and I need to say yes to Jesus today. Or maybe you're, you're watching online today, and you're just, maybe you've drifted from the truth of God. You've drifted from Jesus, and the things of, and, and you just, man, the things of this world have just, moved you away from the path and the courage of God. And today, you want to make a recommitment to Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is your personal declaration of faith today. If that's you, just slip up a hand. I just want to pray with you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Thank you, God. And I would just ask this morning that we would all repeat this prayer as we help those making the greatest decision of their life today. Dear Jesus, I thank you for what you did on the cross. And I ask this morning that you would forgive me of all my sins, that you would come into my life and be my Lord and King. And from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for staying connected to Passionate Life Church. If you'd like more information, you can email us at passionatelifechurch at gmail.com. Be sure to like, subscribe, or share this with a friend. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.